chapter 13 that is written. In fact, though this is a testimony, it can be a sermon in itself. In the book of Romans chapter 13, verse 8 that is written, Oh, no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Praise God in the New Testament. We can be they that fulfill the law. I have met many who profess to be Christians who are trying to keep the law, which is impossible to do in your own flesh and strength. But here in the Word of God, not only can we keep the law, we can fulfill the law, all summed up in this. Love one another. The Lord cares more about how we treat other people than anything else. In fact, in heaven, in eternity, is going to be with many other people. No man is an island to himself. God did not create us to be on our own. For many professing Christians, they believe that judgment will be a theological test. Many professing Christians think that God is going to give them a test, and if you pass and answer the right questions and say yes to the right things, you're worthy of heaven. But in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus Christ says it's going to be different. He's going to look at, did you feed those who are hungry? Did you give drink to those who are thirsty? Did you clothe those who are naked? Did you entertain strangers? Did you visit those who are sick or in prison? The Lord cares how we treat other people. Throughout the New Testament, the Lord tells us to pray for many things. And there's many promises of prayer in the New Testament. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, it is the first time that Christ mentions prayer. And the first time that Christ mentions prayer in the Gospels, it is to pray for your enemies. Therefore, if you're not praying for your enemies, anything else you're praying for will not come to pass. God cares how we treat other people. I was born again back in 1995, 25 years ago, on the streets here in Bangkok, Thailand, and I've been preaching the gospel in the streets for the past 25 years. The streets are my school. The streets are where we get to exercise our faith. This faith, like a muscle, needs to be exercised. You don't exercise your faith. Well, just like a muscle, you'll, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. And for 25 years, we've been able to exercise our faith on the street, learn more of the Lord on the streets, as the streets is our school. However, the past seven months, the streets have been closed. They're empty. The lights are turned off. It's very sad to see the streets in the situation that there are. My heart is for the streets. Last year, my family and I were blessed to go to the Philippines, to Manila, uh, Masai City, and we loved it. Why? Because it was so streets. There was so much we could do. Though we're asked to preach at a conference, we spent more time on the streets outside the conference going to work. We fell in love with a place such as that where the streets were so real. We love the streets. But for the past seven months, the streets have been closed. They've been empty. The lights are turned off. There's no more red lights flashing. It's quite sad, but the Lord keeps us in shape. The Lord has not forsaken us. The Lord continues to work on us. The Lord continues to keep us in school. Just like a prize fighter who may not have a big prize fight within a year or two years, but it's very important for that prize fighter to stay in the gym and have good sparring partners to keep in shape. And praise God, for the past seven months, in the building we're living at with 444 rooms, next door to us, we got the worst neighbors in the whole wide world. These neighbors 
on the walls. They party late into the night. They slap their children, fight their children, throw dishes, break dishes, fight in the hallway. I guess because there's so many of them in the room and they all want to use the phone at the same time, they'll talk in the hallways on their phone right in front of our door with no care whatsoever. In the middle we live in, we have to share the trash can. And there's a certain place where the trash can is located. And they'll sit right there in front of the door where you can't throw your trash away. And you try to ask them to move, they get offended. You bother them while they're on their phone. And then when they move just a little bit and you're trying to throw the trash away, if you drop some trash near them, they get very offended upset as if you try to do something to them. They're the worst neighbors in the world, which, praise God, has kept us in spiritual shape. And praise God, as these other rooms are petitioning to get out of the building, trying to kick them out. There's a board in the middle living in. They're trying to call to get the police involved to have them arrested. Our room is the only one that has not complained. Did they get blessed by that? No. They came to our room a few days ago and blamed us for all their problems. Their claim was, if we had taken better care of them, they would have no problems with anybody else. And they blamed us for all the problems they're having in that room and told us we are terrible Christians at that and we're liars. We don't know God. But praise God, this keeps us in spiritual shape, keeps us praying for them. Because once again, if you're not praying for your enemies, None of your other prayers are going to work. We need enemies to pray for. And we're not on the streets right now, but God brings enemies next door to bless us, to continue to keep us in that walk of love, to even love our enemies, pray for our enemies, and bless our enemies. And now we're praying for the opportunity that God will use us to bless them. Praise the Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy faithfulness, for this day which thou hast made, that we rejoice and be glad in it, the Lord's day, the first day of the week. And as newborn babes, we desire, O oh Lord, the sincere milk of thy word. Sanctify us with thy truth, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Last month, I left off with this verse of scripture in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation, chapter 12, verse 11. In which it is written, And they overcame him, the devil, or Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. If we don't overcome the devil, you can't get anything else done correctly. The Bible tells us in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the reason why people don't believe is the God of this world, lowercase g, the devil, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. So you can have the greatest preacher in the world with the greatest preacher's voice graduating from the greatest Bible school in the world, and if he does not overcome the devil, all of his labor is in vain. You can take evidences of God's creation, of God's word being true, and present these facts, absolute truth, to an unbeliever. But if you don't overcome the devil, all of your labor is in vain. He blinds the minds of them that believe not. Even if he put the facts in front of their face, they'll still reject it and still disbelieve it. He has got to overcome the devil. And how do we overcome the devil? The Bible says we overcome the devil by the blood of them and by the word of their testimony and love not our lives unto the death. If we don't overcome the devil, or if a man of God doesn't have power for the devil, all of his labor is in vain. We have an enemy. The enemy is not flesh and blood. We are to love our enemies. They can be our brethren. They can spend eternity with us in heaven. Our real enemy is the devil. Romans chapter 12. We're to overcome not our enemies, but the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 21. 
not overcome evil, but overcome evil with good. We're not to overcome evil people. We're not to fight with evil people. We're not to win evil people. We're to overcome evil itself. And by overcoming evil itself, that's how we can win souls to the Lord. And how do we do this? By loving not our lives unto the death. You see, in Romans chapter 12, it is written in verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Yet, easy to say, let's put it into practice. When people falsely accuse you, when they hate you for no reason, when they speak evil of you and you've done nothing wrong, can you do this and not avenge yourselves? If they physically attack you or harm you or harm your family or those you love, can you do what the Bible says here to avenge not yourselves? Brother, give place of the wrath. For it's written, vengeance is mine, our pain, say the Lord. Therefore, let the enemy hunger, feed him, and be thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, that shall he holds a fire in his head. Be that overcome be evil, but overcome evil with good. If you love your life and love the things of this life, and your whole focus is on this world and this life, which the Bible tells us is as a vapor, it appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. But if your treasures are on this world and your focus is on this life, and you are in heaven now, and you are God's best now, you are everything now in your life now, when somebody does you wrong, you're not going to be able to be one of those who avenge not evil and even bless their enemies and overcome evil with good. We must overcome the devil by not loving our lives unto the death. Now, I am a Christian that was born in America. I am not an American who is a Christian, and I'm not an American Christian. I am a Christian who was born in America. There is a difference between a Christian who was born in America than an American Christian or a American who is a Christian. You see, there are some things that America does that I cannot do. In fact, they make you swear oaths. To do anything involved with the U.S. government, you have to swear an oath. But I'm a Christian. Though I was born in America, I obey Jesus Christ who says, swear not at all. And whom the Apostle James says, to not swear that your yea be yea and your nay be nay. And that gets us into all kinds of sticky situations when it comes to passports and things and all that the government, where the U.S. government wants you to swear on everything, but I cannot do so. If the U.S. government asks me to kill people, I'd have to say no. If they say, if you don't kill these enemies, we're going to put you in prison, I would go to prison. I'm a Christian who is poor than America. And not an American Christian or an American who is a Christian. And now in this month, the eyes of the world are on the United States of America. And now in this month, until the beginning of next month, many Christians around the world are focused on the United States of America. Many people are watching the news now to keep track of what's going on in the United States of America. And it's going to get dirty in the next few weeks. You're going to find all kinds of dirt on people and false accusations going to be made. The one thing you're not going to see is the practice of Christianity or charity or what we're preaching right here, loving your enemies, or things such as this here in the coming month. And as many are focused on America and focused on what's happening in America this month and praying for America, I want to go back in time today. I want to take a little time trip and let's go all the way back to 1845. What happened in 1845? Back in the year 1845, a ship was arriving to the United States of America. And thousands and thousands of Americans were gathered at the pier at the dock awaiting that ship. On that ship, they had a man that America deemed as its hero. In the hands of any of those thousands, was a biography that was written about that man by his late wife, who had given her life for the Lord. And as this man was arriving in 1845 to the United States of America, all the newspapers were there. They didn't have the video cameras or the news media like they do today, but they had the newspapers. And all the newspaper 
Brothers were focused on this man. The last time he was on the shores of America where he was born was in 1812. 33 years later, he has returned. When he left in 1812, he was just in his 20s, still a youth. Now, I know people think people in the 20s are old. We 20-year-olds think they're old, but we who have got some age on us, we know a 20-year-old is still a kid. They're still the youth. And that young man in 1812, in his 20s, left the shores of America with his newly wed wife. She died. He didn't return back with her. He had to bury her. He was remarried after her death. That wife died as well. This man had married two of his wives in that 33-year time span. And seven of his children he had to marry as well. When he left in 1812, he was a man in his 20s with a new family. And on 1845, he's returned and had to marry two of his wives, had to marry seven of his children. He had no voice at all. This man had preached so much that not only did he have a hoarse preacher's voice like some of us have, this man had graduated. He had no voice whatsoever. As he boarded the ship and thousands were cheering him as America's hero, as he boarded the ship, he was very skinny. His body had been through a lot. He had been in a prison for over a year, falsely accused of being a spy. And for over a year he slept with his feet in the air, four feet tied to that moon, head on the ground, suffered and tortured, had been through many diseases and almost died many a times. Diseases that were incurable, diseases that could have taken other people. His body was beat. His voice was down to a whisper. And the Americans cheered him on and named him the Saint of Burma. Adam, I read Judson, America's first missionary. And because of that man, the churches in America focused on missions. Because of that man, churches in America, Christians, would give up everything to add to the call to go into the world and preach the gospel of every creature, following that man's example as a death sentence. To answer such a call meant you're going to die and never turn back home. You're going to give up everything. Family, you're going to lose everything and die in the service of the Lord. He was America's first missionary. He set the example for American missions. And now looking back in hindsight, which is 2020, it's clear, we can see why did America bless the United States of America. It was not because they're paying government. That government makes this America, they worship idols. On the Capitol building, they have a statue of an idol on the very top to Columbia, a false pagan goddess. They have dedicated their capital, the Washington, the Capitol makes this America to be the district of a false pagan goddess called Columbia. It was not because the pagans in Washington, D.C., that God blessed the United States of America. And it was not because of those corrupt politicians who lie and cheat and do all kinds of things that are 100% contrary to God's word. They are not the reason why God blessed the United States of America. It was because of those who followed the example of that man of God, Adonai Reb Judson. You see, the country of America became a nation in 1776. After a very bad war, a war of rebellion, a war of revolt, and once they won that war, they were a poor country, no money, the country is devastated by war. But just a few short years later, a man like Adam and Judson was born. At the age of three, he learned to read the Bible. And not just any Bible. This is in the 1700s now. This is in the late 1700s. They only had one Bible version. This one. The one that Christians today claim is too hard to read. You meet graduates from college today who say, oh, I can't read that version. It's too hard. I don't understand it. Out of Judson at three years of age, learn to read the Bible. Three years old. Before he was able to do other things, he was reading God's Word. His father was a pastor. He grew up at the age of three reading God's Word. At the age of 16, he left university. When he did his uh, entrance exam, he went to see if he passed, and he went to the 
hard to read from this one, the authorized version of the Bible. The guys are so educated. He got educated out of the faith and became a deist. And there now, in the early 1800s, the United States of America had just become a nation. It was a brand new nation. Here was this valedictorian. He graduated university. He was a deist. He rejected the God of the Bible. He did not believe in heaven or in hell. He did not believe in Jesus Christ. He rejected the book that taught him how to read, and God gave him the education that he had. And as a deist, he went back to his family, told his father, who was a pastor, that he was a deist now, rejected his God, rejected the Bible. His father even admitted, because of his education, he could not stand against them and let it be. His mother's tears were the only thing that convicted him. And this young man went to New York City. There was no California back then. There was no Hollywood back then. And there was no mood motion pictures. It was the plays. And Adam Johnson had this ambition to be famous in the world, to be a playwright, to write famous plays in New York City, but failed miserably. During university, that good friend, his name was Jacob Eames. Jacob Eames and Nanorite Judson were two deists that nobody could fight against. No Christian could argue against them. They would take Christians out of the faith, and they went their separate ways. And as Adam Judson left New York City, lost, now not know what to do, he came across an inn that had parked his horse and spent the night. The innkeeper told him, there's no rooms here. Adam Judson said, I'm very tired. It's late at night. I cannot go on any farther. I don't know this area. Well, the innkeeper said, you're, you're very wise on the travel at night. This can be a very dangerous part of, part of the world. The innkeeper said, I have one room that's partitioned with a sheet. The man in the bed next to the, on the other side of the sheet is dying. And our judge said, both said, I'm a deist. Death doesn't bother me. I have no fear of death. That night, he listened to a man separate my sheet, going to hell. Dying and crying out for hope, crying out for somebody to help him, and that of just knew from his Christian background, from that Bible he learned how to read since he was three years old, what that man needed to hear. All those scriptures came back to him. He could help this man at his death. He could stand by his bedside and comfort him and give him assurance of salvation if you believe was written here in the Word of God, which he still had in him. Though he rejected it. But then what would his friend Jacob Eames ever say about it? If Jacob Eames ever caught wind of this, that Adam Judson, this deist who could have made Christians, had compromised just because a man was dying, what kind of deist would he be? And it wasn't until four in the morning that Adam Judson could go to sleep that night because a man next to him finally died. He woke up the next day in the morning. Went downstairs, the innkeeper, acting like he slept all night because he's a proud deist. As the innkeeper, the innkeeper asked him, Did you sleep with that man screaming like that? And I'm just acting like, What? I didn't hear a thing. The man was screaming, didn't notice at all. The innkeeper, then he asked the innkeeper, Why he's eating his breakfast? So what happened to the man? And the innkeeper said, He died. He died last night in his sleep. And I'm just said, Well, who was he? And the innkeeper said, It was like your age, a real smart man like you. And I'm just asked him, and what was his name? And the name was Jacob Eames, his best friend. The reason why he didn't want to witness to a dying man, his fellow is he heard him go to hell, a tormenting death. Adam just said, got his horse, went back to his mother's house, repented, was born again, and went to Bible school. And there at Bible school, he answered the call to missions. America was so poor at that time that churches could not send out missionaries. They had no money. They asked Adam Judson, we traveled the Atlantic Ocean to England and asked the churches in the United Kingdom to support him in his 
seriously that they didn't even go by faith. This is why God blessed United States America, because of Christians like that. And whenever it doesn't lead the way, missionaries rose up in every church, knowing it was a death sentence, knowing they're going to have to suffer like he suffered on the mission field, but they rose up in every church, they went up every church, and they died, and more missionaries rose up, and more died. In United States America became the nation that sent the most missionaries in the world during those times. That's why God blessed America. They say in America today, they want to make America great again. Therefore, they acknowledge America is not great today. Therefore, they acknowledge America is not what it once was today. They acknowledge that fact. Pro-Americans waving their flags are saying they want to make America great again. Yes, they're not great now. And what is it going to take? They didn't go back to that faith, to real heroes of the faith, like Adam and Judson and those missionaries that followed in his footsteps. Now, I've given you just a brief history of that man's life. He served 33 years, went back to America for nine months, spoke three or four times a day, raised up more missions in the world. Nine months later, he returned back to Burma. In a few short years, he died in Burma, where he served the Lord. At his death, there was only 774, or 776, over 700 Christians at his death in Burma. 20 years later, 20,000 Christians in Burma, and they all point their finger to Adam Judson to this day. And in Burma, the Burmese Christians still acknowledge Adam Judson, and the Bible they use is that Bible it took them 13 years to translate 13 years of hard labor where you almost went blind because of it. 13 years of labor, and they still use that Bible today. Yes, there's some Bible swindlers out there who want to update the Burmese Bible and make it a better Bible version and spend all the money to upgrade the Bible in Burmese. But the Burmese Christians say, reject them all and still stick with Adam Judson's Bible because the legacy he laid. Now, if God can bless such churches in such a pagan country as the United States of America that's so pagan they would dedicate their capital to a false goddess called Columbia, if God would still bless that nation because such a strong church then, what about us today if we follow such an example? Adam and Judson's famous quote is, every missionary, every preacher, every servant of Christ must live by this motto, devoted for life. He loved not his life unto the death. He went to Burma willing to give his life, to preach the gospel, to fulfill Christ's great commission, no matter what it took. And the missionaries of all examples, they all did the same, leaving such a country, hey, United States America, with all of its wealth and all of its blessings and all the materialism to suffer the mission field and die to get the gospel into all of the world. And what did it? What made that man such a hero of the faith? What sparked that young man back in the 1800s to answer the call to go into the world and preach the gospel of every preacher? What caused that man to look up the most heathen nation of the time, Burma, in which they never heard the gospel before? No Burmese and every good Christian before that. What caused that man to answer such a call? And on his way to Burma, there in India, all the missionaries in told him, don't go to Burma, go somewhere else, and still go there nonetheless. And that Edward Judson was back there in Bible college after he was born again, after repenting, after he knew his best friend had died and gone to hell, and now was getting serious with the Lord and a debt to mankind to preach the gospel. While he's in Bible college seeking the Lord, he read a sermon that a man by the name of Reverend Buchanan preached back in India as he's a chaplain to the East India, British East India Company. East, British East India Company. And this chaplain Buchanan preached this sermon that was reported called A Star in the East. And in that sermon, as good sermons always have a testimony, Reverend Buchanan included a testimony in that sermon, a star in the east. Now, that sermon is powerful by itself. It's a very powerful sermon that will stir your soul and then get somebody to 
answer the call for missions. Praise God. I have their sermon. And in that testimony of the sermon, the Reverend Buchanan gave this testimony. And as the Reverend Buchanan was telling the, the civilized world, the Western world, the need for missions, the need to go into the East, the need to go into Asia and the Middle East and all these countries that have not yet heard the gospel, he gave this story of what God was doing there in the East. Again, the title of the sermon is A Star in the East. And Reverend McKenna preached, two Muslims of Arabia, persons of consideration in their own country, have been lately converted to the Christian faith. One of them has already suffered martyrdom. And the other is now engaged in translating the scriptures and concerning plans for the conversion of his countrymen, Arabians, Arabs, Muslims. The name of the martyr was Abdullah. And the name of the other is now translated the scriptures is Sabat. Or as he's called since his Christian baptism, Nathaniel Sabat. Sabat resided my house some time before I left India. And then from his own mouth, the chief or the count, which I shall now give to you. Some particulars I had from others. His conversion took place after the martyrdom of Abdullah, to whose death he, Sabat, was consenting. And he related the circumstances to me with many tears. Abdullah and Sabat were intimate friends, and the young men of family in Arabia, they agreed to travel together and to visit foreign countries. They were both zealous Muslims. Sabat is son of Abraham Sabat, a noble family of the line of Bini Sabat, who traced their pedigree to Muhammad. The two friends left Arabia after paying their adoration to the children of the Prophet of Mecca and traveled through Persia and thence to Kabul. Abdullah was appointed to an office of state under Zeman Shah, king of Kabul, and Sabat left him there and proceeded a tour through Turk Tartary. While Abdullah remained in Kabul, he was converted to the Christian faith by the perusal of a Bible, as I suppose, belonged to a Christian from Armenia, then residing at Kabul. And the Muslim states, it is death for a man of rank to become a Christian. Abdullah endeavored for a time to conceal his conversion, but finding it no longer possible, he determined to flee to some of the Christian churches in the Caspian Sea. He accordingly left Kabul in the skies and had gained the great city of Bakhara and Tartary. When he was in the streets of the city, by his friend Sabat, who immediately recognized him. Sabat had heard of his conversion and flight, and was filled with indignation at his conduct. Abdullah knew his danger, and threw himself at the feet of Sabat. He confessed he was a Christian and bored him by the sacred times of foreign friendship to have escaped with his life. But, sir, said Sabat, when he destroyed himself, I had no pity. I caused my servants to seize him, and I delivered to Murad Shah, king of Bukhara. He was sentenced to die, and heir of the city of Bukhara, and now to the time of his execution. An immense multitude attended, and the chief men of the city. I also went and stood near to Abdullah. He was offered his life if he would abjure Christ. The executioner said, If I had the sword in his hand, no, said he, as if the opposition were possibly complied with. I cannot abjure Christ. And one of his hands was cut off at the wrist. He stood firm, his arm taken by his side of little motion. A physician, by the desire of the king, offered to heal the wound if he would just recant. He made no answer, but looked up steadfastly towards heaven like Stephen the first martyr. His eyes stripped tears. He did not look with anger towards me. He looked at me, but it was benignly. With the confidence of forgiveness, his other hand was then cut off. But, sir, said Sabat, in his imperfect English, he never changed. He never changed. And when he bowed his head to receive the blow of death, all but proceeded to say, What new thing is this? Sabat had indulged the hope that of the law, whatever Kent was off his life, but he saw that his friend was dead. He resigned himself to grief and remorse. He traveled from place to place seeking rest and finding none. At last, he thought he would visit India. He accordingly came to Madras about five years ago. Soon after his arrival, he was appointed the English governor of a mufti, or an expounder of Muslim law. His great third and respectable station in his own country rendered him immediately qualified for the office. And now, the period of his conversion drew near. While he was at this Gapata in the northern Sycars, exercising congressional duties, Providence brought his way a New Testament in Arabic. He read with deep thought the Quran lying before him. He compared it together, and at length the truth.
ability. Praise the Lord. It was such a test like that that caused Henry Judson to answer the call to go into the world and preach the gospel to you. You know what? It's going to cost him his life. He's going to have a life of tribulation, a life of sorrow, a life of pain. And again, he had buried two of his wives in birth, seven of his children. They all died in the service of the Lord. And he himself, at a young age in his 50s, died as well to preach the gospel. But these were men at that time that, that started a great missionary movement that we are the fruit of because of them. And that's why God blessed those churches in that pagan country of the United States of America. That's why America was blessed by God with Christians such as that, with churches such as that. And the churches in America since the 1800s, they put all their finances into missions. And missionaries were exalted in the churches. Missionaries looked up to. Missionaries became the heroes of the faith to the Christians of America. And that's why God blessed those churches and God blessed that country then. See, they're not focused on missions today. In fact, when a missionary comes to America, he's cheered today. In 1845, they cheered at an adjustment. In 2009, they cheered me. I was on an airplane flying from Atlanta, Georgia. My mother had just been brutally murdered by mafia. I had to take care of her funeral. Was it easy? My mother and I were never close. And now I had to be able to take care of her funeral. But this book got me through it all. Praise God for the word of God. On the plane flight from Atlanta, Georgia to New York, and then from New York to Beijing, and Beijing back to Thailand, on that flight, I heard two men conversing with each other behind me as I was reading my Bible. One of them claimed to be a missionary to Turkey, but he teaches English. That was his mission, not preaching the gospel, teaching English. And the other man professed to be, a, he goes to church every Sunday. And the missionary to Turkey asked him, did you ever receive Jesus in your heart one more time? And the man did so as if it was some sort of formula or some sort of ceremony. I knew if I stood in the flight, talk to them, it'd be rude. So I went to wait for the flight land in New York, and then I would converse with them. When the flight landed, they had the sign turned off, unfastened seatbelt, fastened seatbelt signs turned off, took off my seatbelt, got on my belt, turned around and talked to these two men. Another man came up to me, wearing a suit, and began rebuking me, telling me, just because you have a Bible in your hand, doesn't make you better than the rest of us. I said, amen. I agree with you. He said to me, just because you're a body man, it doesn't make you better than us. And everybody there playing joined in with them and cheered me and yelled at me. And those two men behind me, they're having to go to church every Sunday. And the missionary in Turkey, they looked at each other, looked at me, and said, Pharisee. That's how Christians in America treat missionaries. In 1845, they cheered at Aaron Judson. He received a hero's welcome. He was called the Saint of Irma. He was a man they emulated, an example they followed. But in 2009, in that same country, just because a man was carrying the Bible, he was cheered and looked down upon, and a whole airplane, over 100 people, came against me, yelling, saying all sorts of nasty things about me, just because of a Bible my hands. Let's not be like those pagans and heathens across there in the United States of America. Let's put the Christ Great Commission as our priority as Christians. First Timothy, uh, first Peter, first Peter, chapter chapter four. Oh. 
to every preacher. Because not every missionary is preaching the gospel. How do I know? I have been attacked by missionaries from the United States of America for preaching the gospel. Back in the year 2010, as I was preaching the gospel at Chang Lang Lake Bazaar, an old American missionary man dressed in tight silk clothing crossed the road and began screaming and yelling at my ear, claiming that I was turning people away from the Lord, that I was ruining his work, that I had a religious spirit in me, and then as loud as he could in my ear while I'm preaching the gospel, and a crowd was gathered hearing the preaching of the gospel, he began to try to cast a spirit out of me. Now, scary for him is, I do have the spirit in me, the Holy Ghost. And Christ says, if you sin against that spirit of the Holy Ghost, it's unpardonable. Yet that so-called missionary had the gall to try to cast the spirit out of me. After trying many times to make him as loud as he could, he finally gave up. He lost his voice. And then he said to me, one day, buddy, you'll meet somebody. He'll set you free. Free from preaching the gospel. Free from the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what's become of American Christians today. That's how they treat the preaching the gospel today, even on the mission field. I've testified before. Many years ago, I was preaching the gospel on Platform Road, and an American missionary tried to stop us. If I mentioned his name, you would get a red face. You'd know him. He tried to stop us preaching the gospel. Nine policemen were called on the scene. When the nine policemen showed us, a lot of people now nodding as an army policeman. When that missionary who is hard with young man is preaching me, tell us how we should be doing this. It's wrong. We're doing the wrong way. We're not supposed to be preaching. You have to do it another way. But he saw that policeman. He ran to them and begged them to arrest us, to put us in prison. A fellow American missionary wanted to have us arrested all because we're preaching the gospel to Bangkok's then most famous red light area. The policemen didn't know what to do. A Buddhist monk showed up on the scene. The Buddhist monk showed up the scene, and a, a security guard from the CP Tower building, he used as a megaphone through a traffic. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Using a megaphone through a traffic, he ran and gave the megaphone to the Buddhist monk because these heathen Buddhists believe that their monks have powers and their mantras. And they wanted their monk to use a mantra to silence us preaching the gospel. But at that time, I did not know this was going on. I was preaching the Thai tongue. That is appointed at the end, once and I am after this is judgment. Me call the monk, so you want me to buy a gun deal and come and me buy a gun deal. The monk began listening to me. He had never heard this before. It was a complete opposite of his heathen religion. While he was listening to me, his megaphone began going down. It began going down lower. He was listening to preach the gospel. When he came to himself and saw the policeman had hopes in him and the security guards and everybody's looking at him, he returned the megaphone and the security guard and ran away. And the policeman came up to the one man preacher and said to him in the tie top, Tell that preacher no man can stop him. He had preached every day of the week and tell him to preach two hours of time at that. And they saluted me and walked away. But that missionary with his head in his hands in shame. America can never be great again, no matter who they let, no matter who comes to power, until the church gets back right with God in America with the Great Commission. Until the Christians in America fulfill Christ's Great Commission. And we must learn from this. We that are not in America, and most of us here are not Americans, we must learn from their example, just like God left Israel as an example of the world. When they backslid, their whole land was devastated. Their temple was destroyed. They were kicked out of the land. And God did that to show the world what happens when a nation forsakes God. And now you're seeing the fall of America. It's going to fall. It's going to burn. It's going to be no more because of 
thy living witnesses, for thou art the God of the living and not the dead. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who live. The God of Adam and Judson who is still alive today. The God of Adam and Judson's wives who gave their life to the servant Lord are alive today. They stand around us as witnesses to us to take up our crosses to follow thee in these last days in which this God